Thank you for your patience. Thank you so very much for your patience as we are about to get underway and kick off our second our second Reformer Town Hall. Thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for investing this Thursday night uh, with us. We know that you could have been anywhere else in the world, except you chose to be here with us at the Reform Alliance, and we are so very grateful to have you here. Stand by. We're going to have a very, very, very awesome and dynamic conversation this evening. Stand by. Don't touch the place. Don't touch your channel. Don't touch the button. Uh, if you need to get closer to your router, we want you to do that. Uh, you are at the right time with the right people at the right moment. Stand by. Once again, everyone, thank you for joining us. We are going to get started in approximately 30 seconds. 30 seconds, we wanna give everyone uh, the opportunity to get in, uh, get on, and uh, uh, to get in line uh, with us tonight. In 30 seconds, we will start, we will begin the program. Thank you so very much for your patience. I feel like that's about 30 seconds. If it's not, you guys can continue to count down. Welcome everyone uh, on behalf of Robert Rooks, the CEO of the Reform Alliance, who unfortunately was unable to be uh, with us this evening. Uh, my name is Lewis L. Reed, and I'm the senior advisor to, for the executive leadership team here at the Reform Alliance. And when I mean here, I'm literally mean here in the space uh, where the Reform Alliance headquarters is in New York, New York. Uh, for those who attended, our first town hall in February, February, welcome back. It's great to have you again, just like family. For those tuning in the first time, it's amazing to have you here with us. Uh, on behalf of Robert, who spent more than two decades in the criminal justice reform movement, he believes in a system that holds people both responsible and accountable while also creating pathways to rehabilitation, employment, and well-being. Unfortunately, that's not the system that we have today. It's a system that shuts too many people out of our economy and it perpetuates a prison to poverty and a prison, a poverty to prison pipeline. Um, and so for people with criminal records, they are employed less, they make less, and they are shut out from many jobs because of myriad of restrictions. Incarceration and supervision take an enormous toll on people's lives and livelihoods. After incarceration, finding work can be an extreme uphill battle. This is something that I know very personable. Uh, even after the pandemic, formerly incarcerated people had an unemployment rate of 27%, higher than that at any given point during the Great Depression. Depression. That is something that is absolutely absurd uh, and remarkable uh, to, to point out. The conditions of supervision pose huge barriers to getting and maintaining a job. When you're on probation or parole, you have curfews, uh, there's distance restrictions, meeting requirements. I mean, the obstacles are in fact endless. Not to mention the challenges of securing housing and navigating the labor market with the stigma of a conviction. The American Bar Association says to one felony conviction, to one criminal conviction, not even a felony conviction, but for one criminal conviction, there are approximately 46,000 collateral consequences uh, um, uh, that sanctions people in being able to move into society. And we all know too well that the economic consequences are especially devastating for Black, Brown, and poor white people specifically. So, what we have to do is we have to provide a pathway to economic opportunity for more people, and particularly those who are formerly incarcerated and those who are under supervision. Doing so means stronger families as well as stronger communities. We are working across the country to repair cracks in the system, to advocate for, train, for change in the private and public sectors. So more people impacted by the system can work to change laws, to change hiring policies, to change the way society views people who have past convictions. No one's destiny should preclude them from their history. Let me say that one more time. No one's destiny should preclude them from their history. 
Now, while not all of us have been impacted directly by the system, we can all testify to the importance of self-reflection and also self-improvement. Second Chance Month, which April is, is an important time to reflect on the second chances we've been given, the lessons we've learned, and our mission at Reform to actually reform the criminal legal system so that it provides real opportunities for rehabilitation. To understand the meaning of second chances requires that we step into one another's shoes and instill empathy in each other and into the next generation. With your energetic engagement, I know that we will continue to create change and second chances for more people, if not fair chances for everyone who's been impacted by the criminal legal system. Thank you so very much for being here. I want to um, point to personal privilege and say that the people who are on this line and the people who are tuned in, we know that you are absolutely dedicated you are passionate and you are compassionate about people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system. And so before we begin, I just wanna take a moment. I know that many people who are on this call have fought for years and even decades to transform the system from courtrooms to cell blocks all the way to the C-suites. At Reform, we like to celebrate our wins and we like to celebrate our partners when they win because we all know how hard it is for all of us to fight for our communities. Yesterday, in a landmark announcement, the Department of Justice finally announced that Parchman Prison in Mississippi was violating the constitutional rights of men incarcerated there. This took years. Those men living in subhuman conditions with bugs in their food, feces in their water, severe understaffing, 10 men died over the last three years at Parchment. Those, those are 10 lives too many. And while this was happening, those men inside did everything that they could to advocate for themselves. They released cell phone footage of conditions of confinement there. They had loved ones reach out to everyone that they could. They made calls, they knocked on doors, they put the bat sign uh, up and out into the sky, even when the night seemed to be uh, bleak and foggy and no one seemed to be paying attention. However, our partners at Team Rock, Rock Nation, Jay-Z, and the entire family over there answered their car, uh, they answered their call. Uh, our founding board members, Jay-Z, Sean Jay-Z Carter, and Rock Nation CEO, Desiree Perez, they immediately sprung into action and they went to work. Our very own Jessica Jackson, who's our chief advocacy officer, she got to work as well. Marcy Croft, a lawyer in Oklahoma, she got to work. And finally, after all of this work that was put in, after all of this passion that was exerted, finally, yesterday, the DOG acknowledged that this is inhumane. This is unconstitutional, and they're going to step in and make sure that that situation in parchment is changed. Uh, and this isn't the end by any means, but it's a big, huge step forward for those families, for those men, and for all of us in this fight together. So I just wanted to interrupt our regularly scheduled program to give you that breaking news and um, that, that that breaking news uh, announcement. In the event, if you didn't hear it yesterday, you are hearing it today, and we want to celebrate the people at Rock Nation, our family, and our founding uh, board member Jay Z, Desiree. Perez and the entire family who's been a part of this Parchman fight. Okay, deep collective breath. So we are here to host the town hall in honor of Second Chance Month. It's an opportunity for all of us to highlight the great work that's being done across all segments of society in support of people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. It's also a moment for us to reflect on our belief in redemption and the notion that one's history in fact, does not define their destiny. We have an incredible plant panel today. We have Senator Juan Barrett, a lawmaker from Mississippi who has been able to accomplish multiple bipartisan wins in the legislature, including as lead author of SB 270, uh, 2795, uh, legislation reform supported that will reduce Mississippi's disproportionate high in prison rate. It's also going to reduce the state's prison population and make Mississippi communities safer. Shout out to Senator Barnett. Next, 
Uh, we have someone who is uh, developing. I, I personally believe that we're developing a, a, a friendship. I'm going to see him over this coming weekend. Pastor Steve Hare, his ministry in Delaware and his Reach Gospel Radio Network reaches tens of thousands of people. And we're excited to partner with Pastor Hare at his upcoming festival, festival of Hope this weekend. Last but not least, pointing to personal privilege again, my sister, uh, Topeka K. Sam. This is a woman who really needs no introduction, uh, but for the sake of those who you, those of you who do not know Topeka, allow me to introduce my sister. Uh, Topeka was released from federal prison in 2015, but instead of uh, turning away from her past, she actually leaned into her present and her future. She continued to reach back and free other women from incarceration, change conditions of confinement. Uh, she's literally passed about 15 bills minimum uh, across the country. She's led our uh, the Dignity for Incarcerated Women's campaign. The reason why you know the name Miss Alice Marie Johnson is because of my sister, uh, Topeka K. Sam, and Topeka has worked tirelessly on behalf of women all across this country. So I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome all of you and thank you so very much for joining us today. I'm going to start off with a question for our, all of our panelists, uh, and I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, if you got your bonnets on, if you got your do rags on, uh, if you <laughs> if you are not appropriate, we want you to get appropriate, and we want you to dig in uh, and 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 make yourself feel at home. So, question number one. Uh, without further ado, you all come to this issue from very different perspectives. Uh, can you talk about what drew you into this work and what keeps you committed to your belief in second chances? I'm actually going to toss this question over uh, initially to Pastor here, and I'm really, really, really just curious about what drew you to, into this work and what keeps you committed to the belief in second chances. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this great, great panel and this great evening. And what had happened to me, I'd had years ago, I was uh, driving in an area uh, that had been all over the newspaper. And uh, I was very concerned as a pastor. This was, this was uh, many years ago. And something in my gut told me to drive directly into that area. And I began to drive into that area that was impacted by many of the things that we're discussing and going to discuss. And I'll never forget, there was a young man and I, I would say maybe he's 15 and he's sitting in a wheelchair and he has all, he's all in black, wearing black, black gloves, whatever it is. And I paused my car for a second and my eyes locked into his and he's smoking some weed. And when I looked in his eyes, it was like I could hear a message of desperation, of something that was crying out for help. And I, I, and I went on and I drove around that area. And it was then that I felt down, in, down in, in, in my heart that God wanted me to target and go after these areas. It was the next week that I met with my leadership there at the ministry. And I said, I've had this experience. We're going to this area. If you're not going with me, I'll go by myself. But we're going to this area, door to door, and we're gonna earn the trust of this precious community. Long story after that, long story short after that, we went in there, we rented the little park in the, in, in, in the front, had a great event, had a lot of things that the people needed, gave them to the families, and we began a bus outreach ministry. In less than two months, we were filling up three buses out of that one area, impacting about 150 lives, bringing them to our afternoon rally that we called Elevate. And it was in that experience that I learned that the church at large has got to be more than it claims to be when it's holding a service, but it's got to be the authentic church that Christ showed. He didn't even have a building. He walked among the people and he was always finding him around people that needed a second chance. Fast forward, we kept that bus ministry going. 
There were some Sundays, to God be the glory, we had over 33 buses filled with youth. Couldn't get them all in the building. And then come the pandemic. Mm. But then we started, we thought, you know what? The pandemic's not going to get in the way. So we used our, our radio network. God has been uh, good to us, and we own and operate 20 FM stations. We call it the Reach Gospel Radio Network in markets like Philly, Buffalo, outside of uh, Memphis, and so forth. And so we began to reach out to all of the listeners in those areas, and we began to build a model of outreach called the Festival of Hope, which we're holding one this weekend in the city of Wilmington, the second chance outreach, we call it. People will be able to walk into that facility. And when they come in there, they're going to have all these community partners dealing, whether it be housing, addiction, mental health, grief counseling, uh, all of these different areas of need and, and a huge job fair. But the feature is going to be the second chance, being able to get one-on-one -on -one sessions with people in the legal system. And Pastor here, I, I just want to interrupt for a second, um, and I want to bring Topeka in here um, because I know, you know, I, I know Topeka personally, um, but I want to ask this question for the benefit of our viewing audience. Topeka, what what actually drew you into this work? Um, when you were released from incarceration, you could have done anything else, um, and you could have uh, you you could have done anything else. What what kept you in the work, and and what's your belief in second second chances? Right, um, Lewis. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Pastor Hare, for the work that you're doing and excited to learn more and also um, know about what's happening in Delaware. Some really great opportunities happening. So just want to connect you to that since you're there. Um, but what drew me to the work was me being in prison. Uh, while I was there, as you, Lou, we see the things that are happening um, when we are in a sense or a place of privilege. I was incarcerated. I had great family support, mentors, friends. I had visits every week. If there was a job that I could get, if there was one, I got that job. If it was a grade one position in the federal prison, I held that. Um, I did not go without. I had abundance even in there. And so for me, being with the sisters that I was there with, I saw that there was lack and there was um, no hope. And there was no opportunity. And so when God woke me up in the middle of the night and stated that I needed to do this work and I needed to start the organization and I needed to create platforms for women to use their voice and housing for women and girls who were being released from prison and jail and that the organization would be called the Ladies of Hope Ministries. And I was given grace and mercy and released in May of 2015 instead of September of 2021. I knew that my calling was great and that I had to do what God anointed me to do. And so when I was released, the thing that kept me connected to the work is that calling is each and every sister that I meet each and every day, um, whether it's going into a prison to speak even now, um, having recently went into Aliceville, Alabama prison, um, or to in community, whether it's from probation and parole offices, halfway houses, whether it's meeting with corporate partners to get them to think about how they're giving people fair chance opportunities who never may have even had a chance, whether it's affordable housing and building development projects, because we also need safe, beautiful places to live, whether it's food insecurity, connecting sisters to resources as it relates to learning how to lobby and pass legislation. As you know, Louis said earlier that many of us did. I was fortunate enough with the support of Jessica and Van and all Alex at Cut 50, um, that it was the sisters who were previously incarcerated that led that legislation in their states. And so, you know, it was for me and every day that I do this, whether it is here in the United States or in another country, women, uh, we are the least, of any population, we are the most marginalized. And then when you think about women uh, who have been previously incarcerated, you know, you, we are even less thought of. And so it was important for me to continue to lead in this work um, from my experience, because again, of being so fortunate um, to do so. And so that's why I do what I do. Appreciate it. And I'm gonna come back to you. I just want you to uh, pause there for a second. Uh, uh, 
Senator uh, Barnett, uh, as a lawmaker, you've been able to build unlikely alliances from, with people from different political affiliations, uh, different regions, and very different perspectives. What counsel might you have for how to bring people together and overcome obstacles to policy reform, especially in what seems to be such a, a politically polarized and divisive environment? Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? We can hear you great. Thank you. Good, good, good. Well, first of all, I think I need to give you just a, a quick rundown, if I if I may, or my background as to how um, I landed in this area of criminal justice reform. Uh, and unlike many, you know, mine is, is quite different. Um, in 1991, when I was deployed to Desert Storm, um, I was notified on a Wednesday after that Super Bowl Sunday that my father was murdered. And uh, being the oldest of, of four children, of course, I had to leave from there, fly home, and bury my father on that on that following on that same Saturday. I'm sorry. And I went back to the war, and I stayed in touch with my mom and everyone else. And at the end of the day, the young man that killed my father did very, very little time in jail, and I was angry at our justice system because I felt like um, they had let me and my family down by not prosecuting this young man, not holding him accountable for the for the murder of my father. And for years, um, I just held that against our justice system. So I was one of those people that regardless of, of what anyone did um, to land them in jail or prison, I felt like that's where they needed to be uh, because of what had happened to my father. And for years and years after that, I just held that in. And, and for some reason in my life, regardless of, of what I did, I, I kept finding myself in an empty place. And it's like one day I was just sitting around and, and God just spoke to me. And he said, you know, one, in order for you to be able to move from this place where you are in your life to this place, then you're going to have to just forgive and let me handle this. And I began to do that. I just let God have it. And not knowing that years later that he would land me um, in the legislature in Mississippi, and on top of that, to be appointed by the lieutenant governor as the chairman of corrections. So I think when I speak to people about prison reform or giving individuals a second chance on life, I'm speaking to them from a victim that has lost a family member, my father, who never got a chance to see his children grow up, never got a chance to see his grandchildren, never got a chance to do any of those things. But even as a victim, I still believe that there are some good people who have made some bad choices and need a second chance on life. And I think that when I speak to them from that perspective, then they understand that, hey, here is here is a victim, someone that, 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 that lost a close family member that's still advocating um, so that other individuals who have made a uh, a mistake in life can have a second chance on life, and I think just that's that's what pulls everyone together is hearing a victim speak for to advocate for those people who can't really speak for themselves. And I just know that a lot of those people who are incarcerated just need to know that hey, someone is willing to forgive me of my past, regardless of what it was, and believe in me. And that's what I'm here to do, and and I enjoy doing it. Thank you so very much, uh, Senator Barnett, for sharing that story. Um, I'm actually coming up on the one year anniversary of having lost my dad. Uh, my father was murdered uh, last year and he fought on, he held on to life for approximately two weeks before he passed away the day before Mother's Day. Um, so oftentimes the issue of justice reform um, is not as clear cut and is not as black and white as we often we often think that it is. So I think you I really do appreciate your level of vulnerability. I also want to remind the audience that if you have any questions, uh, if you have any Q, there is going to be a Q&A session uh, momentarily. So if you have any questions, uh, we want to encourage you to drop your questions in the chat. Uh, you have subject matter experts from literally all walks of life um, who are here and at the ready to answer your questions. Uh, and so I want to, I want to, you know, I, I, I hear a common theme in between Topeka threaded over to Pastor here all the way to uh, Mississippi and Senator Barnett and that's faith and it's interesting that April second chance month happens to fall on the same month as three major religious holidays Ramadan 
Passover and Easter. And that faith is a theme for all four of us on this panel. Um, if this month is about reinforcing our belief in redemption, can you tell me what that means to you? How can we talk, act, and you know, just put our faith into action? I want to start with first, first and foremost, with Topeka. Thank you, Louis. Well, I mean, I think redemption for me is just you know the air that I breathe every single day. The fact that, you know, God grants me grace and mercy every time that I wake up each and every morning and that I have an opportunity to do it again. And that was whether I was laying on that prison bunk or, you know, laying where I'm laying now. Um, you know, redemption is of God. It's not of man. And so when I realized, um, one, when I asked God for forgiveness, I knew that I was redeemed. And at that point, it wasn't for me to have to prove myself or to get the acceptance of my peers or anyone else. I needed to move in the way that I knew that God needed me to do, which is why um, for us in, at the organization, we focus on uh, that spiritual component as well. It's and, what's your, and your organization again, Topeka? Sorry, the Ladies of Hope Ministries. Thank um, you. Thank you. And our vision, we say it's epics and poverty and incarceration of women and girls globally. And so, you know, so often we talk about, you know, it is second chance month, right? But I know for me, God has granted me a grace and mercy and many chances, uh, more than just a second one. And, you know, I have been um, educated that there are some people who never even had a chance, right? They were born into certain circumstances, into cer certain conditions um, where they only had what was in front of them. And so it is our... Um, responsibility as believers um, and as people of God, those of us who do have that faith and understanding that we are to give people grace and mercy, we are to give and lead in love, and um, we are to provide those opportunities. I mean, even in any word, whether it is in the Quran or in the Torah or in the, in the scriptures, I mean, it, it all is about how we helping people that are of the least of us and it's also about how we giving people those opportunities also. Once you have paid your debt to society in this country, it is incarceration for many. And sometimes that debt has been paid over and over again. There should be no reason why a person cannot truly be able to have a new opportunity to transform their life and that of their families once that debt is paid. Thank you so much, Topeka. Pastor here, uh, same question for you. Um, how can we reinforce our belief in redemption and what does redemption actually mean to you uh, in context of April being National Second Chance Month? And additionally, how can we walk, talk, and act uh, on that belief of redemption? How can it show up in our work every day? Well, I believe that the greatest showing of redemption was when there were three crosses, Christ in the center, and the last thing he did before he gave his last breath, he turned to two people that were being crucified for whatever they had done. And the one obviously denied him, but the other looked at him and said, remember me. When I think of that, it was kind of like, I need another chance. I'm about to check out of this life. And, and I've had enough hell in my life. I don't want to go there after I've had all this in my life. Would you give me another chance? And to think that, the Lord looked at him immediately and he said, today, right now, I'm giving you that chance. You're coming with me. And I think that it's so important that the faith community have a right now kind of attitude. I'm thinking of that scripture. It says a just man falls seven times, but he rises up again. But many times when people fall, they need help in rising back up. Who's going to step forward and help them and to say, you know what, except for the grace of God, like Topeka was saying, that's exactly, you know, where, where I would be myself. So I think we need to remember that the most important thing is giving to others what we need ourselves. All of us need a huge dose of mercy every day. Mm -hmm. And we need to look beyond what the person has done and look to what they can be. Oh, amen. Amen. Uh, Senator Barnett, uh, same with you. How, how, how can redemption or how does redemption show up and how, how you legislate, how you interact with your constituents and just quite frankly, how, how it has shaped you as a human being? Well, 
you know, Pastor kind of stole a little bit of what I was going to say, and, and I could just remember the, when the question was posed to Jesus and asked, how, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus said, well, seven times seven. And then he further went on to say, as often as you need to. And by me being a legislator, you know, I'm not one of those people that just want to talk about things that we need to do, but there has to be some action. And we need to do some of these things and, and put some things into place to let these individuals know that, hey, we are truly giving you a second chance. And, and I have to remind my Senate colleagues and, and House colleagues as well, you know, none of us are so perfect that we can't look back over our lives and say that only by the grace of God that we are not that person who is asking for that, for that second chance like the people that, that I'm advocating for, because none of us are so full or so holy that, that we can say that, that we haven't made a mistake and that if God can forgive me, then surely we can forgive our brothers and our sisters for some of the mistakes that they made in life. Thank you so very much. You know, all three of you, I'm reminded of John chapter eight and irrespective as to whether or not you believe in Jesus as the Messiah, if you think that he was a prophet, if you think that he was just a great human, me human being, uh, the principles that he espoused are transferable through millennia. And I think about John chapter eight, where there was a woman, incidentally, Topeka, you talk about women being marginalized and women being on the, the fringes of society. Uh, it just so happened that there was a woman who got caught and uh, the crime did not match the so-called punishment. And there were people who were exacting um, retribution on her. And one of the things that Jesus said, he who is without sin, let you cast the first stone. And ultimately, that woman was exonerated from the thing that very thing that she had been arrested and had been on a public trial for. Uh, and ultimately, Jesus uh, exonerated her. And so I think that more grace is going to equal more love. More love is going to give us more power. And with more power, we can see how much we ourselves need to be redeemed, uh, not from poor decisions, not necessarily just from sin, not necessarily just from iniquity, but just from being human, human in life. And so I just want to thank you so very much um, for, for this great discussion. I want to toss it over to my colleague, Alex Gudich, who is going to select and facilitate some Q&A for us. Alex, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Lewis. Um, go ahead and submit uh, your questions. I'll, I, I actually, I'll start with a question um, that, that Lewis, you asked, but uh, Senator Barnett, I don't think you had a chance to answer, um, which was, you know, can you talk about kind of building those bridges and how you were able to do that in the legislature? You passed bills under two Republican mm -hmm. governors, and I think we'd like to hear about how, how you did that. Well, the first thing uh, that I did was to, like I said earlier, was to not talk from a uh, a person that has been formerly incarcerated or had a family member incarcerated, but to speak to them from a victim and let them know that, hey, you know, this is what I experienced. But I also know that there are so many individuals who deserve a second chance. And my question to my Republican senator, I mean, my Republican colleagues, uh, was the question was, are you conservative as you say you are? And what I meant by that it was that how long are we going to use taxpayer dollars to incarcerate individuals for lifetimes for crimes that they should have been released from? How long are we going to continue to spend taxpayers' money on what we on what I call the most expensive boarding school in Mississippi? How long? Are we going to not let these individuals get out and not be a burden on the taxpayers, but be taxpayers as well? Let these individuals have an opportunity to be on our tax rolls and not on the backs of our taxpayers. And I think they began to listen to those things. And unfortunately, you know, we had all of the things going on at, at Parchman and around the place and, and all of the investigations was going on in Alabama. And the more I talked to them, I just kept asking the question, how many billions 
will Mississippi be ready to spend, knowing that Alabama just had to spend over a billion dollars to correct their problem? And they began to listen, and we began to have conversations, and not only with the governors, but with the DAs, with our sheriffs, and all of the stakeholders that had something to do um, um, with incarceration. And, and they just began to listen, and the more they listened, um, then the more I just began to expound on them the importance of, of what we need to do to fix this problem. And, and I asked them, the, the, I think the most important question that needs to be asked is that if we're truly calling this the Mississippi Department of Corrections, when are we going to be on the side of correcting versus being on the side of continuing to put obstacles in individuals' uh, paths so that they can continue to come back and be a part of our state prison system? And as they began to buy into it, then we began to pass legislation uh, that has changed uh, a lot of things in Mississippi. Right now, I think Mississippi, we are no longer um, the state that has the most incarcerated individuals. In March, I think we had less than 16,000 people incarcerated in Mississippi. And this was largely in part due to Senate Bill 2795 that was signed last year. Um, by our governor. So I just stay in front of them and I just I just stay on the point that we need to be about the business of correcting um, the problem and helping these young men and young women become productive citizens again so that we don't always be last when it comes to giving individuals a second chance on life. Um, thank you for that, Senator Barnett. I appreciate it. Um, there's a lot of folks in the chat who are sharing their experiences. Um, you know, this, uh, Cheryl Jackson saying, you know, please pray for my son. He was sentenced to 48 years. Um, does reform do anything around extreme sentencing? Um, don't answer that question yet. Uh, um, we have Shimon Clark, you know, the Connecticut parole board is being hard on me for trying to start my own trucking business as far as traveling out of state is it's holding me back. Um, thank you for sharing that, Shimon. Um, when, when, when this section concludes, Britton Smith uh, is going to come on. He's going to share some ways that folks like you can get involved with reform. So I hope you all um, stay tuned. Um, so let me pick a quick question here. It's like, Alex, can I just respond to the trucking oh, company yes, question please. real quick? Yes, of okay. course. Um, just to the trucking company question or statement, <clears throat> um, you know, unfortunately, everything is a fight. Right, but God equips us with all the tools and the people and the resources and things that we need to continue to move forward. I mean, when I started my organization, I had to fight. You know, I was told through uh, federal supervision that I could not travel from the Bronx to Brooklyn. That in order for me to travel from the Bronx to Brooklyn, that I had to get permission every time I wanted to go from one borough to the next, which was ridiculous. To but, Peter, and, and for the purposes of people who are not familiar with New York, how far is the Bronx to Brooklyn? On the train, it could be 30, 45 minutes tops, maybe, um, you know, depending on what part, where you get on in the Bronx to where you go in Brooklyn. But it is the next borough over through Manhattan. And, you know, I was working. So the fact that my job had me moving throughout the city at the time, there was no reason why I should have had to request permission, but they were just being overly punitive. And what I did was I decided to fight. And so, you know, I went through the chain of command. I, I, when my probation officer didn't support, I went to the chief probation officer. When they said, well, my movements were rem reminiscent of a drug dealer <laughs> that I could not travel, I got an attorney. Attorney was the, a federal public defender and that attorney helped me take it to the court. And when I went to the court, the judge said, this is ridiculous, you can travel. And we just went back and forth. And so I think don't stop. Like, you know, we created a Know Your Rights God a while ago about these things, that you do have rights. And just because you're under supervision does not mean you cannot travel, right? You cannot start businesses. If your JNC judgment and commitment says something, you can always go back to the judge and request. And they do have attorneys, public defenders, um, and other nonprofit organizations like the NACDL that can actually help you um, with legal representation in order to help you get what you need to do in order to start your businesses. So I just wanted to um, give you a little bit of encouragement and hope that it is annoying and it is incredibly frustrating, but it can be done. 
Hey, Alex, Burnett, go ahead. Say something real quick, of course. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mika, thank you for sharing that. But um, also in Mississippi, uh, to make I took that a little, I took that a step farther in this legislative session. And under Senate Bill 2273, um, that, that, and I'm waiting on the governor to sign it, and he's told me that he would. What this bill basically does is that for those individuals who are on probation or on parole right now, and even those that get out who will be on probation or parole, their employers will be able to send in this individual's time reports, uh, make payroll deductions for any fee that they may have to pay to the state, and or drug test them as well, uh, so that these individuals now do not have to leave work at, at, at inconvenient times to go and report to a probation officer or see them. And this bill is important to me because I just know that when an individual gets out of prison and they go and find work, then you have a parole officer or probation officer that will call them at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, you need to come and see me. Well, that's a hardship. Uh, now, you know, after so many days of, of missing work, now the employees will let them go and they find themselves back in the Department of Correction again because we have made it hard for these individuals to actually be, get out and be successful. So this bill basically says that if you are working and your employer verify that you are at work and you're doing all these things, then you really don't have to go and see a probation officer because I just don't think that the state should be in the business of finding ways to have person have an individual that's really trying to do the best that they can to return to a place where we just left them go from. So again, yes, ma'am, there is hope out there. And I do just, just like to ask if you would push your state legislatures and your state um, and your federal uh, people as well to come up with creative ways that that where the state could be helpful in helping you become uh, that productive citizen that we all know that you can be versus always putting barriers in place that hinders anyone from doing that. Thank you for that, Senator. Um, I've got, I've got this one question, but I think, you know, there's a lot of questions. We're not gonna be able to get to all of, all of them, but I think this one covers uh, several. And the question is, um, these issues are intertwined. It's from an anonymous user, um, crime, poverty, homelessness. What resolutions have we made to try to combat these issues early on, like at schools, with discrimination education at homes, with overworked and underpaid parents, with community advocacy, providing more resources in financially challenged communities. So these issues are all, uh, maybe somebody can speak to how these issues are all interrelated and build upon each other and what we can do uh, you know, prior to justice involvement, et cetera. Um, I'll just touch a little bit on that, um, Alex. So, I mean, this is about just creating equitable systems and ec equitable opportunities for people, period. I do understand there are organizations that, and people who focus on prior to people going to prison, going through these systems of harm and abuse. Um, and there is opportunity and work to stop that. As it relates to this particular platform or forum, this is about how are we decarcerating, how are we reforming, how are we changing the system as it stands now, and how are we then providing opportunities for healthy communities so we can also stop this generational cycle of uh, children going into prison that then turns into you know years and years um, later. What I will say is this that you know for the work that we do at the Ladies of Hope Ministries, we look at our work as into two pillars. Um, one is direct service and sustainability, and the other one is advocacy and engagement. Uh, what we know is that we cannot advocate for ourselves. We can't change policy. We can't even recommend solutions if our basic human rights are met or not met, which is safe and affordable housing, access to healthy food, access to great health care, and access through an equitable opportunity in a career and or entrepreneurship training and development. That should be every single person's basic right. Then we work with children and youth by providing them mentors and opportunities to get through high school and then on to college to that point. But we are one organization and there are millions of people who have convictions in this country, millions of people who are presently in prison and millions of people are, who are in prison in community outside of, we even, even touch the systems of uh, sex and human trafficking, substance mis uh, misuse, um, aging out of foster care, 
um, all of these systems that are intertwined. And so while we have right now 123 people on this call, this gives every single person on this call an opportunity to choose which part of this system that they feel most connected and driven to in order to help change the system so everyone has equity. And we can truly take some of these dollars and take them out, in, out of these systems of harm and put them back into communities that are marginalized and, you know, out in there. Thank you, Topeka. Um, we, we, we are at time, but I, I had two very quick ones. Um, one, Lu, Lu, maybe Lewis, this is for you. Um, there's a lot of people in here asking about support, asking, does, you know, I have this issue with this case, does, can reform help me? Um, can, can you address that, that question? Yeah, without question. Um, so look, um, we would love to be able to help everyone uh, in all four corners of this country. We, we really would. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we focus on policy, transforming policy for people who are currently on probation. Notwithstanding, we do partner with grassroots organizations who very well may have a legal apparatus who can support people who are asking for legal help. Um, uh, the LOHM is one of our grassroots organizations who are doing great work specifically with women who are coming home from incarceration in the city of New York. Um, we also partner with we also partner with uh, uh, attorneys um, who are doing things uh, on a pro bono uh, uh, status. But you also have to consider that there's an operative word there, pro bono. That means that they're not getting paid for it. It also means that they have to um, be licensed in a certain state where people are asking uh, for, for help in, um, et cetera. So um, what my recommendation would be, if there's any person who has um, uh, uh, a need. Um, as you mentioned, Alex, I would encourage them to reach out to us. Um, I think that Britain is going to have our email address and or you could just DM any one of our social media handles. Um, we are on on social media at all uh, on all channels at reform. Um, and or you can DM me specifically. I'm on Instagram at he inspires the number four real and or on Twitter at Lewis L. Reed. Um, we are at the ready. We are super responsive to uh, the needs and we're very empathetic to what people are going through. And we, if there's, a, if there's an appropriate resource within our network that we can connect you with, you can best believe that we are in fact going to connect you. Thank you very much, Lewis. We also got a couple offers to partner. I got um, Sharif over at Cisco, huge company. He runs a second chance program for people with criminal history. He says, how can we partner um, Sharif, just email me and anybody else whose question did not get answered. I'm alex at reformalliance.com. I'll make sure you get set up with the right person internally, get your question or your issue addressed. Um, we have Britain coming on in just a minute to find uh, to share um, some exciting news and some ways that you all can uh, get engaged with us at Reform. But before we leave, I wanted to give the pastor, Pastor Hare, we're so excited to partner with you this weekend at the Festival of Hope. And I just, I just want, yeah, I, I didn't see a, a question, but I wanted to give you a, a minute or two just to close out this segment. And, um, and thank you for, thank you all for your participation. Well, I want to thank everyone once again for the, the privilege and honor to be a part of this great, uh, this great vision, this great initiative, and the great work that everybody on the panel is doing. And uh, my heart is, is, is filled with hope and optimism, even though I know that there is a lot of work to be done. Um, I want everyone to know that, that we are here to, to serve, to encourage anything that we have seen that might be effective. Uh, we, we are here. We also want you to know officially at Reform and anyone else that is on this panel that we want to use this uh, large megaphone that God has provided uh, through these radio stations, Reach Gospel Radio, uh, to share and to educate and to motivate people uh, on how they can, in their communities, get connected to the information that they need to begin to make change, uh, you know, in other people's lives and families and relatives and so forth and so on. But uh, I, I believe I believe that that there is a great change that is coming because there's so many great people like on this panel and other around this country who are saying enough is enough and that uh, mercy 
must be shown and we must look. I want to say it again, look beyond what the person has done and look at what they can be. So I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. And we're here to serve any way that we can be a help. Uh, we are we are here. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Topeka. Thank you, Lewis. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you, uh, escort you down into the audience here. And, and I've got uh, my man, Britton, who uh, takes center stage. Britton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. And I hope everyone is having uh, as great a time as I am with that amazing panel. Uh, thank you again, Lewis, Topeka, Senator Barnett, and Pastor Hare. There's a reason why we're called the Reform Alliance. It's because our work would not be possible without the amazing partners and allies we have all across the country. Groups that not only work with us to achieve our legislative wins, but groups that help contribute to our vision of a system that moves people from supervision to stability and well being. At our last town hall, we announced our PA community grants, where we provided funding for, to frontline and direct services, or direct service organizations in Pennsylvania. Today, I'm excited to share that we are launching our national second chance grant, a program for groups all across the country. These funds will go to organizations that are supporting people coming out of prisons, supporting people on supervision, and supporting families impacted by the justice system. Our goal is for people to reenter society with dignity, to remove barriers to their financial independence, and equip them with the tools to succeed, all while making families and communities safer and stronger. We will be announcing the application next week, so please make sure you're following us on social media and subscribe to our email list. Before we close, I wanna celebrate and shout out our team and our amazing coalition of ally groups in the state of Florida. Because of the engagement of reformers like you all on this town hall and the great folks from the advocacy community, our conservative partners, law enforcement allies, et cetera, we were able to unanimously pass legislation in the Florida legislature to provide workforce credit and education credits for people on probation. We also expanded remote reporting so people aren't driving hours and hours to check in with their probation officers, which would also limit technical violations. All that work and so much of our work around the country is propelled by members. So please join us to fight for more wins. Become a reformer. Now to become a reformer, text reform, R-E-F-O-R-M to 81411. I'll say that again, text reform, to 81411. By becoming a reformer, you gain exclusive access to concerts, festivals, and other membership benefits. Sharing your story. When you start seeing the faces of system impacted individuals and hearing what happens to them before and after incarceration, it changes the narrative. If you have been directly impacted by the justice system and would like to share your experience, please fill out our survey, which is also in the chat. Again, the ways you can work with us, you can become a reformer, share your personal story of how you've been impacted by parole or probation and or by applying to our national second chance grant. Thank you to Pika, Senator Barnett, Pastor Hare for joining us in an impactful discussion. On behalf of our CEO, Robert Rooks and the Reform Alliance family, Thank you all again for joining us.